Hi, I'm Martin Luther King III. Today we're going to meet a man who had a dream. His name is George Dawson. And at the age of 98, he decided to go back to school to learn to read and write. Let's go meet him. Oh, by the way, he doesn't know I'm coming. Today, Martin Luther King III presents the inspirational story of a man and his teacher. At the age of 98, George Dawson entered the classroom for the first time. Now at age 102, he has co-authored his autobiography, Life is So Good. His story will serve as a reminder to all of us that it is never too late to dream. Next on this special edition of Interviews. Voices from the Inside Out. Interviews, a different kind of talk television. Have fun with it. Okay. And go with it. A word that we do not use and do not show today. Courtesy. Teacher's name again is Mr. Henry. Carl. Carl Henry. It's an object to clap. I clap on top of the table. Hi, I'm Gary Bernstein. Nice to meet you. Hello, class. How are you going? We have somebody coming in right now, and on behalf of Wisdom Television, it is my honor to introduce you all to Mark Sluter in the third. Extraordinary experience. Would you come up front with me? Yes, sir. We should all be inspired because if a man at 98 years old, who now I think is 102, can go back to school, decide to pursue an education, pursue excellence, at 98 years begin the process of learning to read and write, this man we should all be very proud of. One thing about time, and I'm sure Mr. Dawson will tell us this, is that it stops for no one. It continues to go. And what we have to do every day is try to make the best of our lives, try to, to make the most out of life, and, and live life to the fullest. Uh, I know that if my father were in our midst, he would challenge us in that way. A long life, longevity has its place. Mr. Dawson. What is it that has made uh, your life so good? What makes my life makes my life so good? I'm not hard-headed. I'm easy to get along with, and I always like some good, kind talk of me. Now, at at 98 years old, what caused you to decide? Well, I want to go and learn how to read. Well, I can run up on lots of places where people would read. They'd sit down and be reading the paper. I'd pass by them, be sitting down and eating or something. They'd eat and read the paper. Why? I could, I'd eat all right enough, but I couldn't read the paper. And that kept me bothering. And when I began to look, no one letter from another, understand. If I could read as fast as I could spell, well, I wouldn't ask nobody no question. Moses. Oh, but since I got the word that I could read, Mr. Henry taking care of me. I know what I'm looking at and know what I see. And I enjoy that. That's my life. The man who helped George prove it's never too late to learn, his teacher, Carl Henry. What does it mean to be the person responsible for making Mr. Dawson's dream become a reality? Uh, it's an awesome feeling. In fact, uh, I had really not dreamed that it would bring about all of these things. I thought it was going to be a simple thing. I mean, simply a person who wanted to come and learn how to read. I would teach him how to read. He would read, and that would basically be it. But look at all of the things that have happened. 
for me, it's, it's, it's really, I can't think of the words to describe it. When Mr. Dawson mentioned his age, uh, being a teacher, I simply said, oh. And I had all kinds of strange thoughts that ran through my mind. What were some of those thoughts? How in the world can you teach a 98-year-old man to read? Or anything. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you do? And here you have a gentleman who actually, he's new. He's like a newborn baby, but he's 98. What do you do? My mother is a teacher at Pearl C. Anderson, and she has read your book to her students. And it's been an inspiration to them. And I was wondering if you could give the students of today some good advice, what would it be? Well, the advice to go to be at school is to go to school and obey. Don't stop. Go to school and obey. Obey your mother and father at home at first thing. Tell mother everything. Tell father whatever happened. Tell mother and tell the truth. That's your life. Mr. Dawson, how did you feel on your first day of school? I feel good that I accomplished something that I long wanted. Good. Do you remember the very first thing that you learned? My ABC. I learned them in two days. I learned them backwards and forwards. I learned them both. I was determined. That's why did I made it. All, all my jobs, wherever I went, I was determined to do the job. Mr. Dawson, can you can you recite your the ABCs for us? Recite ABC A B C D E F G H A I J K L M N O P Q R S T U V W X Y Z. And life is so good. George shared his remarkable story with his co-author Richard Glaubman. What factor do you believe contributed to Mr. Dawson deciding to learn to read at 98 years old? Well, the easy part is that someone came by with a flyer for an adult literacy class. And I think they expected when they talked to him that maybe he'd have a grandchild in the house that needed to go to learn how to read. But he said, I'm coming. And uh, sure enough, he did. He told me that, well, he wasn't so busy anymore. And as he told them, he's tired of fishing. It's time to go. He retired, stopped working at the age of 90 uh, from his gardening work, and just spent the days fishing. And it was time to, time to learn to read. And it's that simple, according to him. Mr. Dawson has been a student here at the school since 1996. And if you ask him, he can tell you exactly the month and the day. Uh, he came and he learned his ABCs, he learned how to write his name. So he's gone through all of those phases. And each phase that he's gone through, I mean, he's basically mastered it. Not only is he an exemplary student, he's a fascinating one. Does he do homework? Uh, yeah, he does. He does some. Uh -huh. Basically, his homework, he likes to read the Bible. When he first came, that was the primary thing that he wanted to do. He wanted to be able to read passages from the Bible. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. That is very, that's, that's my very long sight. I, I keep that in mind. And that says everything. Yes, sir. Oh, good, very good, <laughs> very good. And uh, I say, I told him after he accomplished that, he got kind of lazy. <laughs> The core of George's strength and determination was to find a long time ago when his ancestors fought in the Civil War. But now during the Civil War, his, his grandfather fought basically to free slaves. Uh, he was a great man, as Mr. Dawson has always said. When blacks first volunteered for the, for, to fight, they uh, were not given any uniform. They were not given any weapons because they were afraid to, they were afraid to give them guns. 
He was a man of strong convictions, and his conviction was that every man deserved to be free. It took 10 years after the Civil War for Mr. Dawson's family to gain their freedom. Why was that? I think that was mentioned sort of in the book that uh, his, his, his ancestors were tricked. Mr. Dawson simply called it a new form of slavery, uh, sharecropping. The master, uh, the ex-master would lend them money but they would only make so much money not to be able to cover the amount that he owed them. The price of freedom was high. Freedom did not end for some when the war was over. For George's relatives, freedom was denied through trickery and deceit. You owe Mr. Lester $87. Yeah, we owe it says right here, Charity, you owe Mr. Lester $105. I don't owe him no money. You ain't free until you pay back Mr. Lester all that money. Their inability to read prevented them from knowing the truth and kept these women and countless other slaves from being set free. It was simply the idea of if we continue to let them owe us money, we'll be able to keep them here on the, on the plantation legally. Definitely. That's right. Mm. He will tell me these stories, but there is no hint of hatred or anything in his voice. I mean, it's just like no reciting. Bitterness. No bitterness, no bitterness at all. It's like simply reciting something that happened in history. Later, George takes Martin fishing and shares some of his best fish stories. But next, oh boys, oh boys, George opens his soul and shares the tragedy that helped define his life. Jackie Robinson in 1955, when he steals home and sets off a still raging controversy. Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier long past George's prime, forcing George to leave his own baseball ambitions on the field of dreams. How important was baseball in the life of George Dawson? He loved to play baseball, and he was proud of it. He told me about his days being a catcher and, and and how his brother Johnny was the pitcher. And I thought that was so great that the two of them were this, the core of any team they'd wander into. Can you share the tragedy of the baseball story? Are you referring to the baseball that Pete gave him? Yes. I guess it had such meaning because, not just because he loved baseball, that was, that really had nothing to do in this case, but because, because it was given to him by Pete. And Pete Spillman was uh, an older friend of George's, like George's idol. I think George was around 10 and Pete was 17. There was a seven year span. Pete was 17 the year he was lynched. And George saw that with his father. I didn't do it! I didn't do it! And Pete was lynched because he was unjustly accused of raping a white girl. Conclusively proved wrong later when the baby was born white. But that's just how it was, and unfortunately, even more so, not so uncommon at the time. But it had a powerful impact on George, in my estimation. I would say it was the defining moment of his life and his father's response to George about it that he cannot judge anybody, even those people, for it, that he has no right to judge another human being. How did you feel as your friend was been taken away uh, and punished for something that he did not do? Well, I didn't feel good over it. And I felt that 
he was, he, they was taking something that they couldn't give back to him. He was taking his life and he, 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 they couldn't give him no life. If there was one thing that his father taught him as a lifelong lesson that would carry him from uh, the cradle really to the grave. What, what struck me so powerfully is the way that, that George has seen a lot of a significant amount of cruelty and, and a lot of injustice in his life and because of what his father said he doesn't judge anybody. He knows what's right and wrong and he's very aware of what he's seen but he doesn't judge the people and let it turn inward, turn that anger, and let it eat at him. And I think that's, that to me is, is something that I've watched. Whether that's the most important thing that he drew from his father, from what he felt, I don't know, but that seemed awfully powerful to me. First, I want to thank everyone, and I know that we've all identified favorite passages from Mr. Dawson's book that we'd like to share. And so the first person I'd like to call on is Joseph Sam. Thank you, Mr. King. I had heard white folks say that colored didn't need school. School that would school be a waste, because the colored way. couldn't learn their reading anyhow. No one in our family knew how to read. But sure enough, one day, my little brother Johnny took out the Bible. It was the only book we had. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, Johnny said. I was smiling. I knew those white folks was wrong, and someday it would be my turn to read too. Innocence didn't last long in George's young life. The carefree days of playing with the white children would soon be over. Playing with whites is only for the young ones, son. You are colored, and you always need to take heed of that, warned his father when George was sent off to work for the little family for much needed money back home. Mr. Dawson, I'd like to read a passage that I think is very interesting. I was 12, but had never been alone like that before. Like that before. I, didn't I didn't find, find any fault with the Littles, so I knew that they meant well. But I would have given anything for a crowded bed with my brother and sisters sleeping and breathing next to me. I pulled out the baseball that Pete had given me, and then I thought of Mama's biscuits. Somehow, out there by myself in the shed, thinking of her biscuits only made me cry. I wanted to be strong, but I couldn't help myself. I just wanted someone, Mama, Mama or Papa, Papa, to say, to say it. it would be okay. We'll now hear from Linda Johnson. Thank you, Mr. King. Ashley always brought the meals now. I don't, I don't know, know if, if anyone, anyone else, else noticed, noticed them, but she stayed longer than a grandma would have. That caused me some confusion, for I couldn't be sure. One day she said, George, how come you never talk to me? I shrugged. I didn't know what to say. You don't want to talk to me? Yeah, I guess that's it. Before she turned away, I thought I saw tears in her eyes. I wanted to say, wait, that's not it at all. I don't want to cause pain to anyone, especially you. But I kept my mouth shut. That night, I held Pete's baseball tight. I knew that saying too much could cause trouble. But then I wondered if saying nothing could be just as bad. Still, Still I knew, I knew that thoughts. to have such thoughts was dangerous. What would you advise us uh, if we wanted to have a long and fulfilling life? Well, one thing, talk to God about that. That's, 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 that's God's job. He give, you, he'll, uh, he give you your mind. You have a solid mind. Use the mind you have. What do you attribute your being uh, so healthy? Uh, you know, I don't have much hair. You have a full head of hair. <laughs> I noticed earlier you said that to me, in fact, that our hair is visibly different. <laughs> <laughs> is there something that you've done? Because if I, if I'd like to go back and know what it is so that I can get like you. Well, there's difference in the the truth is to God give us five senses. He didn't give you the same senses as me, as me but we have five senses. You could have sense to dig in the ground. You could have sense to take up herbs from the ground and make, make you feel happy and make your complexion good or 
help the family, uh, take care of someone that's suffering. So you're saying that the, the herbs from the ground that God created naturally, you used all kind of formulas and remedies if you became sick, and that's what makes you look good today. Because if that's what it is, I need to go and find those herbs. Well, you, you might would go and dig up some and not, and not knowing what you did. That's true. Up. That is definitely <laughs> true. <laughs> well, that's why I want to come spend some time with you so that I can find out what those herbs are. Everything God planted in the earth is good for something. Everything, and he, did, he didn't put nothing down bad. Everything was good. Of the things that you enjoy, is there one thing that you enjoy most doing? Enjoying seeing other people happy and enjoying life. Mm -hmm. Your life is the best thing. But there's got to be something that you do every day. Do you exercise? Do you? No. No exercise? No, I don't do exercise, walking or around, or whatever work I'm doing, that's the only. So it's not exercise. Well, what about the food? How You must eat a special, maybe you eat health food or? Anything I want to eat, eat it. But you don't smoke. No, I don't smoke. And don't drink. And don't drink. Now, you married more than once. You... I married four women. Wow. You're not married now. Are there any plans to, uh, to marry anymore? No, I ain't had no plans yet. <laughs> of course, you never can tell. Your mind is running all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dawson, I uh, am a music lover. I love gospel, I love jazz, I love a lot of music. I read that there were songs that you sang as a child that were very important to help you make it through or music that you liked. <laughs> it might have been the blues or something. Might have been the blues, okay. <laughs> right. okay. What about songs uh, uh, back uh, during slavery time that, uh, or some of the words of those songs? Oh boys, oh boys, and they no need to running. I looked up on the hillside, see old master coming. Bull whoop in one hand, tied in the other, pocket full of leather strain to tie your hands together. <laughs> and on and on. <laughs> that's great. That's, that's very good. <laughs> Later, you'll worship the time we spent with George in his church of 72 years. Well, I know my God. But next, the effects of segregation and how his reaction became the foundation of his beliefs. Quiet but agonized protest. The events in Selma had been brought to a climax by a nighttime attack on a white Boston minister by white men. moves into the downtown area. Death is six minutes away. It was a day that every American remembers, and it happened here in Dealey Plaza on November 22nd, 1963. The assassin's aim is deadly. The area is a swarm with police, rangers, and secret servicemen. The murderer slips the net. The assassination of President John F. Kennedy began a tragic period in our history, a time when riots, civil unrest, the war in Vietnam made this one of our darkest decades. Martin Luther King dedicated his life to love and, and to justice between fellow human beings. April is the cruelest month, wrote the poet. 
April brings Martin Luther King to Memphis for the last time. What do you feel Mr. Dawson's philosophy of life was, particularly on the areas of, of segregation? That's an interesting question because now we talked about that a lot. And uh, my being a teacher, I've learned so much from him about what happened between the races during those times. And uh, I pride myself as being a very historical-minded person. So some of the things that he told me I'd never read of, never heard of, but the interesting thing about all of the things of the segregated society that he lived in, he never hated anyone. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was strange to me because if some of the things he told me had happened to me, if I looked at a person like that, I would want to do something to them. But he said, he always mentions the word love. Love, that's his favorite word, yeah. It's been really one of the greatest experiences of my life, really. Did George Dawson ever fight the system of segregation? I think that that's, that's a good question. I, and I wondered about that in, in his approach to segregation and to those laws. I think that he, he didn't fight it, but he beat it, and he overcame, overcame it at the same time. To fight it directly would have been just futile, and, and he would have died probably. But, well, I know he was a quiet man. And he said he had to be a black man to live that old had to be a very quiet man. But he kept his dignity, and people could do what they wanted to do, and it didn't. He would not let it affect his view of himself or, or let it filter down to his children that way. And I think that's so powerful that, to me, in a way, he beat, he beat that system. He, number one, outlived it, but besides that, more importantly, he kept his dignity throughout it. As he put it to me, George said, when I saw people that were not doing the right thing and were going to cause trouble. He would walk to the other side of the street, but he kept the same direction. I'm sure that you've had discussions with him about the era of the late 50s and 60s. Could you share some of that with us? We have had many, many discussions about that time of the history of our country. Uh, we were so surprised when you walked in the building. They continued to tell us that we were going to have a visitor, but no one told us exactly who it was. But I was so glad when you walked in the room that you had a chance to see the place of honor on our board was your father and mother, right there in the center. It, it was one of the most outstanding times of our country. One, another thing, too, though, it was a very violent time. And uh, Mr. Dawson was saying that he agreed basically with all the things that were going on, but uh, the idea of uh, the denying rights to people to him was so basically wrong that uh, he really didn't know how to deal with it because he always thought that there was some good in everybody. Uh, but at the end, he said, right prevails. And, there, and thanks to your father, everything came out real well. Mr. Dawson, in 1963, you were working for a woman. And at lunchtime, she had said she was going to prepare you some lunch. Can you? Share with us what happened. Well, I went on and went to the, the hour was coming, 12 o'clock. I saw the food out there in the, in the plate. I watched as she put down two bowls on the ground. I looked at it and I decided to myself, well, I wasn't a dog. What hit me was that she expected I would eat out on the porch with her dog. I told myself that I was good enough to eat a meal with people, not dogs. I wasn't no animal, and I wasn't going to eat with no dogs. If I did, she would go on believing that way. I had to keep my pride. Without that, I had nothing. I told her I wouldn't be back. She said, well, don't come back. I didn't. I haven't been there since. <laughs> <laughs> How many people knew that George Dawson was not able to read? I think nobody but his wife or his wives, he's lived, outlived four of them, I guess, but nobody but his wives knew that he couldn't read. And I mean that even including his children. But he helped them with their homework. They'd sit at the kitchen table at night. How? And 
That is the amazing part of how he did that. He told them that they, they needed to read it back to him because they would learn more if they would read it. He checked in on it to make sure they'd done it and give them some feedback, but he obviously couldn't read it, and they never knew that. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing that he could do that and give them that gift of, of that companionship and that time and that expectation that they would do their work, but he just was something that he couldn't do right then was admit that he was illiterate. The person who may have learned the greatest lessons from George Dawson, his oldest son, George Dawson, Jr. When did you learn that he did not have the ability to read or write? Um, I, I was in service at the time, and I had been in approximately a year, and I would write letters that almost be dedicated to him, but he never would answer. And uh, that was kind of disturbing to me. And that's when, uh, when I come home on Eve, I told my mother about it, and that's when she explained it to me, but I never said anything to my sister or no one else about it. Are you the only sibling that knew well, I would rather think that they didn't know, but that was one thing we never talked about. We never brought it up. Why did you never, as a family, talk about the fact that your father was not able to read or write? Well, one reason, I slightly, I, I think I felt ashamed. Uh, then, uh, he was so great, and I wouldn't want anyone to laugh or look down on him, so I figured I'd just lock it up in my closet and forget it. Why do you believe that there's such an interest in his life and story today? As a society, we have done such a good job of achieving the things we want uh, economically, and, and we've, we've, we have everything we need, plus, plus a lot more. And we're still missing something, and George has nothing and has such a rich life. <laughs> and there's something, there's something there that, that tells us something. I can't define it exactly, but to see this man with nothing lead such a rich life, is, it's a humbling experience. It's so powerful. What struck you as one of the most compelling lessons that he has learned from his life? What I've watched him doing, in fact, I've tried to, since spending time with him, is not try to assume what other people know or think. But what I've watched him doing is moving through life without judging people, without criticizing anybody, but he's very aware and accepting. He has a, an amazing power of forgiveness. At the same time, he's still so aware of injustice and cruelty that he sees. Oh, whoa. Right. We'll go out and then take a little break, and then we'll come back. Yeah. And then you can basically see if you can write them by themselves. All right. Although you've been the teacher, you've also, to some degree it appears, been a student. What can others learn from his life experiences? I think the major thing that they can learn from his life experiences is that it's a statement that he makes all of the time. It's never too late to learn. When we come back, we'll find out what makes George Dawson's life so good. Voices from the Inside Out. Interviews. A different kind of talk television. Put a little money in my pocket. The rest down in my boot. I may be a poor man, but I always got some 
George's simple dream of saving enough money in his boots to buy presents for his mom is just one of the stories which has contributed to the success of Life is So Good and helped make another one of George's dreams come true. George Dawson has had a lot of dreams come true lately. One of them is this new brick home that is being erected right now. Mr. Dawson, would you please show me your brand new home? Come on, I'll show you my house. How do you feel about your father building a brand new home? I, uh, I feel wonderful. It seems as though we have accomplished something. A new home and him able to sit down and relax and enjoy it. Something that he wanted, I could imagine. He have always raised us in a good home, but to have one of his own the way he wanted is wonderful, wonderful. And I think it, it would add a couple more years to his life, luckily, on my part. So wonderful. How are you doing? This is my living room. It's beautiful. Beautiful living room. This is my kitchen. Right here is my kitchen. Now, will you cook yourself? I'm going to cook myself. Wow. That's nice. And you're moving in by yourself? Just by you? By myself. Now, this is my fireplace. And this is where my, where my mantle bowl will be. Oh. Over there. It is beautiful. Now, this is going to be your room. This is my room. OK. Very good. And you'll have a, are you going to have a garden now? I'm going to have a garden. I have a garden every year. What do you, what crops do you grow? I put cucumber, okra, pepper, ash potatoes, oh, cabbage, collard. What's the new one I think you can do? Oh my goodness, you're going to have a whole grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely have to come back and get you some come of those. You yes, come with yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, God, so we'll have it. How can he move into his own home at 102 years old, all by himself? Is he truly that independent? He's that, that independent. He can cook for himself. He's got too much water for the whole meal. And he clean. He can do anything that he want, you know. And he can even iron, <laughs> you know. So I have no fear of him living by himself. This is a garage. When was the last time that you drove? Oh, when I was 100 years old. You drove at 100 years old? Wow. 100, I did. That's, That's amazing. Car I drove. When you get through, I'm going to have a dinner. I'm going to almost feed all y'all some barbecue. Well, we, look, we definitely look forward to that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> There's a reason George Dawson entitled his book, Life So Good. One of the reasons is the simple pleasure of a man going fishing. Has he ever talked about fishing or brought any of his uh, fishing pictures to school? When does he not talk about fishing? Uh, actually, fishing yeah. is almost his life. Now, what kind of bait do you usually use? I use chicken liver. Dough bait. What is dough? Dough bait. I fish my own bait. Okay. So that that means your bait helps you to catch the big fish. That's right. All right. <laughs> I like the fish because I like to look at the movement of the water. It's very few people know what the movement of the water means. You sitting there thinking, and things will come to you. Just what to do and how. You pay attention to the water and use your mind. What is the largest fish that you've ever caught? 52 pounds. 52 pounds? In a caught lake? Caught right up there, right up there. Really? Right up there, right up the corner of that lake. 52 yeah. pounds? Uh-huh. My goodness, what kind of line did you have? It must have been a line. That's your line there. 52 pounds. What, what kind of fish was it, though? Catfish. My goodness. That's huge. And we'll you like to eat them? 
Oh, oh yeah. Oh, you look at me. I love to eat. You can tell that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dawson, I know that baseball has been a very important part of your life. Yeah. And I know that uh, when you were a young young man, that uh, your friend Pete gave you a baseball. Yeah. And I understand you have it with you today. It's meant so much uh, to your life, and I can assure you that it will be an inspiration That's right. to the many yeah, millions yeah, yeah. who will see your story. Mr. Dawson, who is your favorite baseball player on the Texas Rangers? Rod Reason. Excuse me. Oh. I'm Norm Lyon. I'm with the Texas Rangers. I'm the Vice President of Community Development and Relations. And we have a great fan here in George Dawson. Mr. Dawson. Yes, sir. He said his favorite play player is Yvonne Rodriguez. So what I thought I would do was bring a jersey that belongs to Yvonne and present to Mr. Dawson. And since you're such a great interviewer, I thought I'd give you one also. Okay. Thank you. So this is great number seven. <laughs> That's That's wonderful. wonderful. And you can almost try that on. Are you proud of your dad? Very much. Very much. Is there any one particular reason that you feel most proud of him? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It'd take a long time. We've got it. <laughs> uh, uh, my dad was real religious. And all through, I mean, from a tot up until I left going into service, it was. It was the rule of the house. You attended church every Sunday. There's something on the inside, working on the outside. Mr. Dawson has a, an incredible love for his family. It is manifested in his children and grandchildren and great grandchildren, and probably generations yet unborn. And then Mr. Dawson has a love for his community. Perhaps most important, Mr. Dawson has a love of God. Love of self, love of community, love of family, love of God. Now to me, that perhaps is what helps to create a successful life. Mr. Dawson, we will continue to pray for you. We love you. We know you love us. And I finally say, may God always bless and keep you. And may your light continue to shine eternally. And may God bless each and every one of you. I thank Brother Martin Luther King for his words, as you said. I know his mother. I know his right <laughs> Why do you think Life is So Good is an appropriate title for your father's book? I think it's a wise, very wise uh, title uh, because uh, Life is only bad to those that make it. Life is automatically good. And uh, I think if you pay attention to your body when you hurt, you'll cry. But once you wipe those tears away, you still got to go, so it's good. 
And you're going to see more good times than bad, even though it doesn't seem as though you do. I think it's a wonderful time. If Mr. Dawson was sitting here right next to you, how would you thank him for what he's meant to your life? Well, I've heard a lot of questions. I haven't heard that one. I'm not sure I can answer it, but I'll try. I think it helps a little bit to sort out what's important, what isn't so important. Uh, and it's just probably the little things that he, that he that where the way he lives it, just be grateful for what is. And he wakes up every day, looks around and goes, hmm, I'm still here. That's, that's what he told me, how he does it. That's how he starts each day. And that's a good thing. And that doesn't matter probably if I'm 50 or 102. It's a good thing to, to probably start out the day and say, oh, that's good. I'm still here. And if I could keep that, that's probably worth it all. The major things that I've learned from Mr. Dawson is his famous statement is, life is so good. No matter what happens, no matter what you've been through, or no matter what you're going through, you are alive. And everything has a good point, uh, even though it seems bad. But eventually, he says, good conquers evil. Well, I want to, to thank you for this very, very special time with you. You are truly an inspiration to all of us. And God bless you. Thank you so much for this Thank time. you very much. Yes, sir. This program is dedicated to the remarkable accomplishments of George Dawson, to his teacher, Carl Henry, and to the memory of Pete. Okay, thank you, and thank you. God bless you. It has really, really been a special experience. And I'm going to come back and see you real soon. All right. I and I will, I will be praying for you every day. Every day. Thank yes, sir. You. And I know you'll be doing the same. I'm glad you that every day. Yes, sir. God bless you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye. Bye, 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 bye. When you get to be my age, I hope you'll come by. I sure hope I'll be able to. <laughs>